Protech 2020 CyberVision, your view on cybersecurity with Richard Steenen and Andy Crocker. Hi, welcome to Protech 2020 CyberVision. I'm Andy Crocker and I'm with Richard Steenen. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we've been off air for a short while because uh, Richard's been extremely busy recently. Richard, what have you been up to? Oh, so much, Andy. And you would think that during a parent recession and the summer doldrums that I wouldn't be busy, but we've been launching an app, which I can talk about in a little bit. But in the meantime, I have launched a book uh, right at the beginning of the summer, Security Yearbook 2022. This is the third edition of it. I publish it every single year in that late May, early June timeframe, depending on supply chain issues with printing and printing paper. Um, and uh, that's what's keeping me busy. It's crazy. Wow. What did, what edition is this one of it? So this is the third edition, the 2022 edition. So basically it, it goes to, to, you know, I freeze it on January 1st. And then we spend, you know, about six weeks assembling it and doing the internal design and embedding all the images and all the rest. And then we send it to the printer and it takes printers 10 to 12 weeks. And get this, in the middle of waiting for the printers to get it in the plant and schedule it, this is digitally printed because it's color. And they got hit by ransomware. And Never. And the most amazing thing is it took them 10 days to recover. They've got 24 plants, mostly in the United States. Um, and in that 10 days, they recovered from backups. And I was so impressed, right? That mm -hmm. old fashioned company, like a printer, um, had backups and was able to recover. Do you know, that's a great story for us because, look, I, I want to speak more about your book, but, but I want to stay with this just for two seconds in that, you know, what we always said about ransomware, we speak about it often, you and I speak about it quite regularly, and we're always saying that people wouldn't be in the, the, the state they're in where they have to negotiate with the cyber criminals or they have to pay money, provided they have backups. If they have good backups, then... And, and you know, lots of companies say, well, we're not really a target. You know, why would we be a target? And a printer, you'd think, no, they're not going to believe they're a target. But they were and they are. And having that backup, all right, it took them a few days to sort it out. But a few days is better than having to pay a huge amount of ransomware and still take the days to get it and encrypt it, et cetera. Yeah. So they've done absolutely the right thing. Wow. Give the CEO yeah. or the CTO, whichever one it was, a big, big pat on the back for, for having that ready. That's really cool. I love that story. Yeah certainly did compliment the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, when you think about it, first of all, the reason for backups are that your IT systems just aren't 100% reliable. And yeah. if your business depends on, in the case of a printer with digital files, depends on it, then of course you're going to have backups because you would have already had outages that yeah. set you way back. And you said, well, mm -hmm. we got to fix this because three days of not printing jobs means three days of loss of revenue. Oh, no money here. Customers. So, yeah, you got to do that. Now, the other interesting thing was they have offset printers as well. And offset is, you know, you basically take a photo of every single page, lay them out 16 pages to a sheet of aluminum, use a laser to etch those, and, and then you use those to transfer the ink to the paper in the press. Oh, those wow. are back in line within two days. Right, they just had to get their systems, their management systems, up and running because those things, even though the lasers are essentially digital, digitally controlled, the offset print uh, printers are all pure mechanical Heidelberg yeah, yeah. presses. Cool, that is a great story. I'm yeah, so impressed with that. <laughs> but it is a little stressful when you're waiting. You know, you. Oh, I bet. I think we had, I don't know, 130 pre-orders. For the books, a lot of people were anxious, reaching out, hey, when's the book being published? Um, and I had to just keep pushing them off. And then the books arrived. Um, so we printed 1,700 this year. And wow. they arrive in cases at the plant. And Karen and I went there, and, and she laid them 250 of them out for all the pre-orders. And, and then I signed them all. So people who pre-ordered got signed copies. And they're the only ones who get 
signed copies because right. you know I've got this great fulfillment house. Um, if somebody orders one, it's automatically fulfilled. If if we send one to somebody because we want them to review it then I send it, but I can't like go there and sign a book. I don't know. Okay. So tell me, look, look, I love that cover, by the way. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. T tell me what the yearbook's all about. Explain to me what it is. Okay. So it comes from the origin story. I was at the big conference in San Francisco, RSA in 2019. And I was signing uh, another book that I had written called Secure Cloud Transformation, the CIO's mm -hmm. Journey. So it's all about, you know, moving to the cloud and securing your uh, your new applications in the cloud and your entire company. Uh, and we I was signing 400 books in a booth for a vendor. And there was a line, you know, wrapping out into the aisleways between the other booths. And everybody came up to me to get a copy, you know, uh, it's hard to think there was a day when I would shake 400 people's hands, but there was, we used to do that. Um, and I realized that, wow, it would be great to have a book like this the next year for RSA 2020 and which was in February the next year. And a lot of the people who came up to me were young and they said, Oh, I'm just getting into the cybersecurity industry. Um, at the time it was, you know, they're going to read my, uh, cloud security book. And <clears throat> so my employer sent me to RSA to learn about the cybersecurity industry. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is the worst place in the world to try and understand the industry because everybody's on the latest buzzword and mm -hmm. you wander around that year, you might've wandered around and thought, oh my gosh, artificial intelligence is changing the entire industry and they all do it. Um, and every year there's a different theme what the vendors are doing there. You've been there. And then I was later on, I was wandering the booths. Um, and as one does, you, you go to the, all the booths on the outside that are the least expensive because that's where the interesting startups are. Yeah. And I, I talked to these young founders and they'd be all excited and probably invested their family's life savings and paying for a booth at RSA. Um, and they, one of them in particular said, Oh yeah, we got this really cool thing. We randomized these, the memory addresses for all system calls. And that makes the device impervious to any sort of exploit because the exploits have to know where to inject into memory. And I said, Oh, like Santa security. And they go, uh, what's that? You know, so, it, so they, they knew nothing about the history of our industry. Yeah. Santa, you know, was around from 2002 to 2004 yeah, yeah, yeah. or sold its IP to somebody. Um, and that's when it just gelled. I said, okay, the book I'm writing is going to be the history of the IT security industry. And that's that's what okay. turned into Security Yearbook. And I've written many books on the history of cyber attacks. So two books on uh, nation state attacks. I've got a third one coming oh. out this, uh, probably early next year. called. Cyber Which ones are they? So the first one, was, the first book I ever wrote was Surviving uh, Cyber War. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. yeah. And that was just, you know, it was published in 2010 and it was just a, you know, took all of the incidents that had occurred that could be attributed to countries. And, you know, the things that weren't quite cyber war at the time. Um, and then after writing that, I realized, well, my publisher actually published it as a textbook, which was unfortunate because it still costs $75 on Amazon. Um, I realized, well, if I'm going to be viewed as somebody who writes a textbook on cyber war, I better have a better academic founding because my concepts of warfare are based on years of being an amateur, you know, historian of, you know, Civil War and World War II, you know, love Napoleonic stuff and, yeah. and Roman and Greek uh, warfare. Um, but that those views are, would be considered, you know, sophomoric and amateurish by any academic. So I went back to school at King's College London to study war and got my master's, wrote my master's on the revolution in military affairs. That was the, actually was a hot topic in the late nineties before counterinsurgency became the academic subject that everybody writes about. And, um, published my master's thesis as my second book on cyber warfare. It's called There Will Be Cyber War. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You go, huh, that's a strange name, Richard. 
most people's reaction is there already is. What are you talking about? <laughs> but from an academic perspective, there's debate about whether cyber war will occur. And as a matter of fact, one of the professors, he was a lecturer then at King's College, um, had published a book called There Is No Cyber War. And he had used Clausewitzian oh. definitions of warfare, you know, use of force, um, and, and, you know, and a for force turns into causing deaths. And yeah, you know, if one, com if one country does a massive denial of service on the power grid of another country, there could be zero deaths. And that's not warfare. That's something else. It's sabotage. Stuxnet was just sabotage. Good old sabotage. Um, even though, you know, you'd think most historians would go, yeah, sabotage is a very important part of warfare. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sneak behind the enemy lines and plant the bombs. That's practically every every movie. Um, 100%. 100%. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think it's a very naive view to say that there'll never be cyber war. Whether we can say that cyber warfare has already started is is open to debate. I believe it has, um, because every war that's been fought just about, there's always been some form of sabotage. Where you know, Second World War, there was massive amounts of. If you are taking out power grids, whether it be by a bomb or whether it be by a, a DDoS attack, you were taking out a power grid that has a strategic advantage within a war gives you a strategic Absolutely. advantage or, or gives the gives the the the, the um the victims a disadvantage in the war okay so it's it, you know it's it's attacking the population so that you know there's no i think it's a very naive thing for them to say that there hasn't been but anyway and if they're going to say that then they should start with their definitions of mm -hmm. what war is etc and that's what i do i say okay cyber war is uh, computer and network attacks and exploitation uh, executed by military organizations in you know yeah. in furtherance of their their goals um and that means okay if you know if it's the um US military shutting down the navigation system of a opposing ship say in the navy um in order to confuse it and introduce the fog of war that's cyber warfare um, and in particular, if the uh, military intelligence unit of Russia, the GRU, mm. uh, executes an attack, not Petya, that takes out most of Ukraine's computer infrastructure and spreads to the rest of the world, that is definitely cyber warfare, right? Because they were at war with Ukraine when it happened. Mm -hmm. I think you can also look at the, the attacks on Georgia, um, you know, the, the cyber attacks that happened just before the kinetic part of the war started you yeah, know sure. when, when russia went into there the, and look i was involved in some of the investigation on that and you know i remember the site get georgia and uh, and you know i remember where it came from it was part of the gru put it up etc um i remember all the things that they they were they were sending out the loic the 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 the, the cannon um to, to 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 help you be able to launch the ddos attacks it gave you a list of government sites to attack yep. how can you not class that as warfare yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, so, and anyway so that was the first two that um yeah. that you did what came next yeah so now i'm working on the uh third book which was actually contracted um at the same time as wrote the first book and i actually sat down and wrote it it was called cyber defense countering targeted attacks mm -hmm. and the publisher you know put up a pre-order page on amazon and we're talking 12 years ago wow and, and i wrote and wrote and wrote i was aiming for you know seventy-five thousand words like the first book and at fifty-four thousand words i just stalled out i had written everything i could on the subject wow. and so i just struggled with how to expand the book and i and then you know i got busy and i went to college again um and mm -hmm. i just let it fester and or actually it was maturing in my mind i guess but then the publisher came back to me early there earlier in 2022 and they said hey you still owe us this manuscript you know and i was all ready to say i forget it but uh, I kept a diary of writing that. It's called The Writing of Cyber Defense. Right. That diary actually is 65,000 words. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And and I went through it and I realized, and I said, huh, I should go look at that manuscript. And it was complete. It was almost ready to submit. It just wasn't long enough. And mm-hmm. in the ensuing 12 years, there's been a lot of things to write about. Yeah. Uh, so you've got more subject matter now. A lot more subject matter. So yeah, I got, okay. I'm in the process of uh, updating the manuscript. And mm-hmm. it's at, I think, uh, what was it late, lately? 65,000 words. So mm-hmm. it's almost ready to go. So, okay. So then then you got on to the yearbooks because you've done three of them. This is the third one. Yeah. What are the yearbooks about? Yeah, so the yearbooks are history of the industry. And so I took advantage of the fact that most of the pioneers in the industry are still with us. So um, in, in addition to writing, you know, my perception of the industry, because I've been involved in it since 1994. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was lucky enough to, because I was at a one of the first MSSPs in the world, um, we're a reseller of Checkpoint software, firewalls. And... So I knew all the founders of Checkpoint. I knew the founders of ISS. Um, so I could reach out to them and get their stories. And they would, you know, just do an hour-long interview and usually capture seven or 8,000 words and uh, winnow that down to 2,000 words and publish their stories alongside the overarching story that I tell. And I take a very um, pragmatic, I guess, approach to uh, the way I segment the industry. So I write the history of DDoS, which of course, you know, involves you and Barrett. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I take the history of endpoint security, which of course goes all the way back to John McAfee and, and Symantec and Mac and, uh, you know, all the gyrations they've gone through. But then I follow the companies because, you know, few people realize that back in the nineties, Symantec and McAfee um, network associates, as it was called, were really PC utility companies. That's, you know, how they got going. Mm. And Symantec, I think, even might have been public before they acquired an antivirus solution out of uh, Ohio. And even Checkpoint kind of, you know, got their start because they had been, um, they had taken a, a little bit of money, so there's some ownership, from an antivirus company. And that antivirus company in Israel got acquired by Symantec and they used that money as some of their initial funding before they went public. So it's fun just to dig into all that and understand how we got to where we are today. And, you know, then I follow the evolution of the firewall as, you know, IPS was folded in as another part that I had some play in, um, which introduced Near Zook. Um, Near Zook and his partner Pradeep created the first uh, IPS solution called OneSecure. They sold, were acquired by NetScreen. Um, At the time, I was the Gartner analyst who put NetScreen as only leader in the Magic Quadrant. And Juniper Networks bought NetScreen for, I think it was $4.5 billion after that. And as long as I was writing this book, um, this was my opportunity to finally publish the directory of all the vendors that I've been collecting for 17 years now. Um, And it's, you know, it's not like, for 17 years, I've had an accurate list. It was, you know, first I I'd collect them all and I find 1300 when I started IT Harvest. Um, and and then I let it malinger for a while and I come back and, you know, half of them are gone because they've been acquired. Um, and there are another 50% new companies. So every year I'd go back and do this exercise. And finally I decided, well, let's, get all that together in a way that's publishable. And I've done that three years in a row. Um, So I've got a really, really clean directory and, and publish that. So you can open it up and find all the vendors of cybersecurity products in all the countries. There's, I don't know, 120 countries that have those. That's a great bit of resource there, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Yeah, And because some changes so fast, there should be an annual update. Yeah. In the listing of each vendor, I list their current headcount and how much it's changed since the previous year. So if you were looking for a product in two-factor authentication, you could say, oh, you know, uh, this one's in my country, but man, they've, they've lost 50% of their personnel. Something's going wow. on. So so that really helps. Oh, they've, they've expanded. They've got 50% more. Yeah. So that might role. be a company that's worth looking at. 
yeah that, 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 that's a great stat to be able to look at yeah 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 and, and mind fantastic. you the format is a little cumbersome but i i still keep one next to my uh, chair uh, in the living room and i have to refer to it often to see if you know i've, I've talked to this company before or, or what they do or give an answer to somebody mm -hmm. on linkedin um and you know what the most frequent question i get when uh, you know i'm pitching this book on online and getting trying to get people to buy it um the first question is always, is there an ebook? And and is there? <laughs> yeah. Every single time I have to explain. First of all, every single one of my books is pirated as soon as it's published on Amazon. Right. And there's nothing you can do. You can on Amazon when you're you know pu you know self-publishing, you can click a little button that says uh you know, use um uh what's let's see, data. You know the data protection that right, yeah. from stealing it, right? DRM, that's it. And but you Google that, and it is trivial to break Amazon's DRM. So like, don't even bother, you know, because it mm -hmm. just makes the file bigger. Um, so people just, you know, one person will buy it, they'll digitize it, redigitize it, and publish it for free on these dark websites or wherever, mm -hmm. and. And usually as an author, that, that's fine because more people are going to read the book and people who probably couldn't afford to buy the book or don't have a credit right. card. Okay. Something on Amazon. That's great. You know, it's just like musicians are happy that people are listening to their music. Um, but in this case, because I've put 4,000 hours into developing that list of, of vendors, I don't want somebody just publishing it for free. Yeah. And a bunch of people will monetize that amazing uh, list and you know just gets out of control so i've only published it as a print book which is pretty good drm right you want to steal this list you've got to scan it and ocr the scans and the scans won't be perfectly flat you know so mm -hmm. now, you could do that you know that's yeah so there is a ebook version and it's a complete web app so we offer this as a uh -huh. yes service yeah um and it's the value of course is you can quickly find what you're looking for and the data is updated so every single month we change the headcount data you know which you, you know when you're looking at a view you can always sort that headcount data the uh addition of Security Your Book that's out now has, I think, 2,800 vendors in it. Um, the the app right now is 2,997, and we've wow. got a backlog of 50 to add. Um, so it just keeps going. For instance, you know, hey, we always had RSA Security as one company, but a year ago, they the uh, acquirers who bought it from Dell, who had bought it from EMC, who had acquired it originally, um, uh, Insight Partners are splitting those out as separate entities. So now we can track headcount at each of those entities. So now you have um, RSA <coughs> Identity Division, uh, Archer, which of course is one of the leading uh, GRC vendors uh, for risk management. Um, uh, NetWitness is a standalone company again, though oh. at some point they're going to sell those off or try and get them to go public again uh we'll see so quickly you can do a search on hey what's your favorite country let's you're in the uh, united kingdom um so i'm gonna just apply a search and we find that there are we've got a few security measures notice i have to refresh the count so the, because i'm only displaying about 25 but you right. pay through them with the next that's to prevent the screen scrapers from getting to work on this stuff. Okay, cool. That's a good idea. Yeah, but 208 is... vendors, you can sort by headcount. Of course, you get big ones, unfortunately, like BT and BSI, who have little tiny security operations, right? BT acquired Counterpain from uh, Bruce Schneier, mm -hmm. and they still have an MSSP for that kind of stuff. But, you know, you get rid of those, and you get the interesting ones, Blue, Blue Cat, uh blanco blanco oh you know blanco it's my old employer yeah and publicly traded listed on the london stock exchange uh show me the indian one 
I saw I noticed countries you had India as one of them. Yep. Yeah. I'm quite interested in that. That that okay. India is really come along. Yeah. Yeah. Now one of the interesting things I did, um, if you you know go look at a uh, company of any sort, um, so you see their whole page. Um, we also track the number of, or where all the employees reside. So if you go to an Indian company, you're going to find hey, most of them are indeed in India. So mm-hmm. 187 out of 216 here. Um, and if they were in the U.S., we'd have them. If they're in U.K., we'd have them. And yeah. I needed to do that because there are a whole bunch of companies that are, in reality, Indian-founded companies that have said they're in the U.S. And I, I allow a company to be listed as a U.S. company or a U.K. company if the founders have moved to the country that they say they reside in. Right. Um but that still doesn't change the fact that in the Indian newspapers would say, no, that's a Indian success story, right? They're Indian citizens who moved to the U S oh. which is great. That's what you should do. Um, and obviously a lot of Israeli companies do that as well. So I'm going to be able to go through, come up with some measure, you know, if 85% of their employees are in India or Israel, then they're actually an Indian or an Israeli company yeah that's that's good yeah no at least you get to know the truth behind them as opposed to what they want you to know that's right Mm -hmm. so you know people always ask oh where do you get the funding information because we track funding for each of these vendors and we are building a process we integrated with a company called feedly and we grab all their news every day on cybersecurity. And then we put it into buckets for M&A news, funding news, regulations, lawsuits. Um, and we can check this every day, see the new funding announcements, and update the database. So we're ahead of sources mm-hmm. like Crunchbase, who you know, won't be that fast because Crunchbase has to monitor 3 million companies. We only have to monitor 3,000. Wow. Hey, you know, I've been, we've had this feature for a month, and I've just keep tracking, you know, look at lawsuits every day just because when one vendor sues another, that's always interesting. Um, and through this and I see the, um, I th- Oh, it was under patents. There's rarely news on patents because people don't treat that as newsworthy enough to issue a press release or get somebody to write about it. But, uh, this morning I look and I see that, um, the, so centripetal networks successfully sued, um cisco for patent violation and got the biggest award in u.s patent history of 2.7 billion billion. wow but last june the judge overruled in in appeals court the judge overruled the original judge because the original judge's wife owned cisco stock and the argument made was that that he was conflicted even though it was you know minor amount right it was probably in a big portfolio Mm -hmm. um so now uh centripetal networks is appealing to the u.s supreme court so it's going to be very expensive for everybody but you can see why centripetal would go for that two billion dollars so that was really quick Mm -hmm. wow well I think that's amazing that app. I, I I love it. I must admit. I know you've shown it to me before, and and, and we we spoke about it. Yeah, yesterday and the day before, and I love it. I must admit, I love the data you can look through. It's fantastic. So, first of all, let's stick with the book, the yearbook. Yep. Twenty twenty two. Where can people get hold of a copy of the yearbook? And yeah, how, so how do they buy? You, yeah, we'll put the link uh, below. But you just go to it hyphen harvest dot com and navigate to the shop. And okay. you'll see That'd all the bro- editions right there. Okay, I'll put the link in the description. What about our viewers getting a bit of discount? I have created a coupon code. So if you use the coupon code PROTECT2020, okay. uh, all one word, all lowercase, mm-hmm. um, you will get a $20 discount. Perfect, perfect. And shipping is free. So, you know, if oh, wow. you're actually outside the U.S., you just got the book for free because it cost me you know, $25 to ship it to, to most 
countries overseas. Wow, that's brilliant. That's great. I just want to get the book out, um, wait until next year's book, because, you know, it was always the uh, turning the book into an app. Now it's going to go the other way. The app is going to generate the book, the content of the book every mm-hmm. year. Um, so all the color and the graphics, um, all the different ways of slicing and dicing the industry will be presented in the book. So it'll be even more valuable. Brilliant. And what about access to that app? How do people get that? Yeah. So because it's a, it's like buying a uh, seat at Gartner. Um, so you just, once again, if you're at IT, the IT hyphen harvest uh, website, you just click on dashboard and that'll take you to the landing page. Um, you can get a free account and you can kind of see some minimal amount of data. Um, if you think you'd like to own a seat and there's two pricing models, one is $6,000 for a researcher who doesn't need access to the analyst, but the one that most organizations go with is the uh, individual seat, which is $12,000 a year, but that includes access to me, right? So schedule anytime calls to review your, wow. whatever you're looking for, could be an investment thesis, mm-hmm. if you're an investor, could be a product acquisition, if you're a CISO, um, quite a few of the existing subscribers uh, actually sell to security companies, which is a really great use case that I hadn't mm. even thought of. So, you know, if you're an events company or um, even a, a search firm that places people at cybersecurity companies, um, if you create videos for cybersecurity companies, then this is great. You know, you can immediately sort, I want to see the uh, 158 vendors that have gotten funding so far this year and the ones that are growing and healthy. Boom, there's your... 150 that you can start going after uh, if you're selling them products. So I'm, the, the most amazing thing of this process is discovering all these use cases by people who reach out to us asking for access. Great. So the yearbook, everybody will put the links in, in it, please. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Go out and buy it. Um, access to you. That's incredible. If, so if you get access to, if you if you pay for access to the, the app, you also get access to you. I would have thought access to you was worth 12 grand straight away. That's fantastic. Thank you. Oh, look, look, fantastic thing. We, 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 we've been on here a while now. I think um, it's time to wrap up now. But thanks very much, Richard, for going through all that. I think next time what we'll do is I think we want, I want to talk a little bit and you and I will discuss a little bit about um, uh, Telegram. I'm really sort of quite into Telegram at the moment and uh, uh, especially as a data source and stuff like that. And, and maybe a little bit around threat intelligence we'll, we'll speak about on our next one. So remember, everyone, if you enjoyed this, First of all, go and buy the book, have a look at Richard's site for access to him and to his app. But also remember to press the subscribe button. Um, And it's been great speaking. Richard, thanks very much. Really good uh, chat with you. I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thank you, Andy. Just bye now.